Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Mullen. I'm here from the uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I'm here to talk about intussusception. I have nothing to disclose. So I'm going to start uh, with a case of a patient that probably isn't that common for many of you in the room, but would be a uh, relatively common patient uh, for me in my hospital. This is the case of a 16-month-old male, otherwise healthy uh, male, uh, presenting with one day of nausea and vomiting, fussiness, uh, it's non-bilious vomiting, and with uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise healthy kid with no medical history, and has an x-ray that looks something like this. Uh, so you see some fairly impressive dilated loops, air fluid levels, and being that this child was seen at a, a children's hospital, the next step was to automatically obtain an ultrasound, which demonstrated this, which is a very typical um, finding for uh, intussusception. This would be called a target sign, which uh, essentially represents a uh, lumen of bowel inside of a, another lumen of bowel, or a bowel inside of the lumen of a bowel uh, with mesentery uh, within that lumen. And uh, We'll come back to that case and see how that child did, but intussusception is very simply an invagination of one portion of the intestine uh, into the other, and this is the most frequent uh, cause of bowel obstruction in infants and toddlers. Um, this was uh, first uh, described by the surgeon uh, John Hunter as an intro-susception in 1789. Uh, so it's obviously been a known entity, and the, the, as you can see, the uh, treatment of this disease has, has evolved over time. It's relatively common. Uh, there is a slight male predominance. And I think the key aspect of this slide is to look at the, uh, what, I, what I have here about age. So the mean age of presentation is 16 months. But as you see, 50% of these cases happen uh, in children under one year. 75 of them occur by the time children are two. And 90% of them occur in children three and under. That doesn't mean that it doesn't happen in older children and adults, which I'm, uh, that I will touch in later, later on the talk. Um, this is a picture of the, the typical idiopathic ileocecal intussusception. And here we can review our uh, annoying nomenclature that we all like to remember uh, and then forget after some sort of a test of the intussusceptum going into the intussusceptiens. Um, and as the, title, as the name of this would indicate, uh, it's, uh, the causes of this really are unclear. A lot of hypotheses uh, abound. We talk a lot about lymphoid hyper, uh, hypertrophy in the area because that is certainly a common finding. We also see this uh, often uh, times come in the wake of a viral illness. And then there are the rest of the patients who, um, who present with some sort of an anatomic lead point or what we call pathologic lead point. And there's a whole list of things that can, that can come up. Some of the more common things would be a Meckel's diverticulum. Um, this can happen with, uh, with appendicitis. Uh, but nonetheless, part of this is really going to be to make sure you're not missing uh, some sort of a pathologic lead point and that you don't have something more than, uh, than something that, an idiopathic disease. Um, when you talk about pathologic lead points, uh, the very common, uh, the very important message here is that the older the child, the more likely you are to have one. Uh, so in children under a year, it's fairly uncommon. Uh, but in children in the older age range, especially getting above three years or five years, uh, your suspicion certainly has to go up. Um, and there are certain things that might heighten your awareness or lead you to think that there may be a pathologic lead point. Uh, where this is in the intestine, if this is a, a colonic process, not an ileoclonic process, uh, then it's more likely. Uh, a, a enteroenteric process is also a little bit more likely than the ileocolic proce uh, process, uh, certainly in older children. And if you have a more chronic uh, presentation uh, with chronic symptoms evolving over weeks or months, or uh, in the cases of recurrent interception. This is the kind of pathologic process that occurs. Um, this is why it's a problem. So you have an intussusception, which results in, as you can imagine, some mesenteric compression, uh, leading to venous congestion and swelling of the intestine, eventually leading to arterial uh, insufficiency and certainly uh, full thickness necrosis, uh, hopefully not before you get there. Um, this generally occurs in a healthy kid. It's acute in onset in most children. Uh, they come in with a day or less of symptoms. And they can really present with a whole spectrum of symptoms. These are some of the more common ones. Uh, but the, the classic triad that we read about of pain, vomiting, and uh, blood per rectum, or the, the classic current rel uh, red current jelly stools that you see here in this picture, uh, representing uh, clotted blood and mucus, really only occurs in about one third of patients. Uh, so what else do you have to look for? Well, it can actually be a bit more subtle than that. 
And this is, uh, this is a study in pediatrics looking at 60,000 consecutive uh, admissions to the emergency department at uh, Boston Children's Hospital in children with abdominal pain. And what they saw is that the most reliable uh, indicators of interception were considerably more subtle. So children greater than six months, male children with lethargy and an abnormal x-ray of, of some kind. Um, on exam, again, really the findings can be all over the place. Certainly if you feel a palpable mass in the right, on the right side, particularly the right upper quadrant, uh, that's uh, very indicative of, of intussusception. Uh, it can, it, you can intussuscept all the way uh, through the colon and have a prolapse uh, through the, uh, have a rectal prolapse, which would be hard to miss. Um, but in general, your physical exam will be much more subtle. And certainly these other findings at the bottom here are, are things that you're going to see later on in, in the, in the pathogenesis of disease. The fact of the matter is our history and our exam are, are only going to diagnose kids 50% of the time, probably less, to be honest, and we need to rely on radiographic studies. Um, and of course, the first thing we're going to start with is an abdominal x-ray for most of these children. And the findings, um, there certainly can be some findings on an x-ray which, uh, which will point you in the direction of an interception. But in general, quite honestly, you're going to find more nonspecific uh, symptoms that you're going to see just more consistent with a bowel obstruction or like this, which is a relatively nonspecific gas pattern, maybe with a, a paucity of distal air. Um, ultrasonography really is the gold standard for workup of this process. And this is great if you're in a children's hospital and you're doing this every day in the emergency department. Um, so it really is going to depend largely on your resources, and there certainly are other tests that can be used to, to accurately diagnose this. Uh, but we certainly use uh, ultrasound, which is very sensitive. And uh, obviously in children with a lot of literature coming out, we're trying to avoid radiation. This is a nice way to do that. Um, so you can get a, you can get a very nice uh, look at the interception. You can look at blood flow to that area as well, which you could argue is not as reliable, but it does give you some information. The disadvantages, of course, with ultrasound is that it's operator dependent. So if you're not in a hospital where your ultrasonographer is doing a lot of this, then it may not be so reliable. Um, these kids can be quite distended, so there's bowel gas uh, interference. And of course, this isn't a therapeutic test. Uh, and these are some of the findings. We saw this picture earlier of the target sign. Uh, this is a pseudo kidney sign where you see the mesentery coming off laterally in your, in your field of view. So one of the key findings is that you're actually seeing mesentery within the lumen of the bowel. Um, contrast enema can be a very good study to diagnose this, and as we'll get into in a minute, to, to treat this. Uh, but this can be a reliable test if, if, um, if uh, you, maybe if you're going down, uh, working up something else, or if you don't have a reliable ultrasound. Um, and the role of CT, well, in our hospital, the role really, there really isn't much of a role. And if we see this on CT, chances are we're working a up child for something else like appendicitis. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not a reliable test for looking at uh, intussusception. And certainly I think that becomes more common when, I look, when we're looking at, um, when I talk a little bit more about older children and adults, and I do have some examples of that. Uh, the management of intussusception, first and foremost, you're going to resuscitate these children. And uh, nowadays, the treatment largely is non-operative, or certainly that's our initial treatment. Uh, so you can re reduce these uh, interceptions through, uh, through an enema. And this can either be uh, hydrostatic, using contrast, using saline, which is, uh, which is sometimes used um, even in the developing world, or pneumatic uh, reduction, which is more common now. And then we'll talk about operative therapy. Um, non-operative reduction, of course, is contraindicated in a patient with peritonitis. Uh, so certainly if you see this on any diagnostic study in a child with a very concerning abdominal exam, certainly the right answer is to go to the operating room. Uh, but the techniques for non-operative reduction involve contrast enema, hydrostatic reduction, as I mentioned, or pneumatic reduction. Um, and then if it doesn't work, if you cannot do this completely, uh, the, the answer would be a surgical reduction. There is a role in some centers for, um, with, a, with a radiologist who's experienced to, who cannot reduce it completely on the first try to try again within a half hour or hour. Um, but once again, this should really, and one of, one of the themes of this is you really need to have a good uh, working relationship with, and with your radiologist and you need to be talking uh, to them uh, as these patients go through this. Overnight observation is also something that I'll touch on in a, in a few minutes. Uh, contrast enema uh, um, uh, can be, uh, is, is an effective means of reduction. It's also an effective means of uh, evaluating the colon, looking for a pathologic lead point. Um, the key is to uh, try to control the amount of pressure uh, 
uh, there certainly is a perforation risk with any of these means of reduction, which is another reason why a surgeon needs to be involved with these patients. Um, and really to, to have a complete reduction, you need to see free reflux of contrast into the uh, ileum for a distance. Um, pneumatic reduction is uh, more common nowadays. Uh, one of the reasons why it's popular is because you can very, uh, you can very tight, tightly control the amount of pressure uh, that, is, uh, it's, uh, that you're providing to the colon and you can, you can change your limits based on the age of the child and there is some literature to support that. You actually can get some pretty good pictures uh, just with pneumatic uh, uh, reduction in children uh, and, it's, um, and it does have a very high reduction rate and it's quick and it's safe. Uh, the disadvantages is it doesn't give you the visualization of lead points um, and uh, maybe a higher rate of false positive reductions. So nowadays often this is followed by contrast as well. So you do your redu pneumatic reduction, you follow with contrast, we would call that an air contrast enema. And this is actually a, a fairly good picture of what you can see with this where you actually see your intussusceptum right here uh, and you're, you're giving uh, air from below and you can see that progress down here and then follow-up film shows uh, a contrast uh, enema uh, showing reflux of contrast and this is water soluble contrast. And simply put, it's reliable, it works and the complication rate is relatively low. And you know, these children, you know, provided that they're not getting sick before your eyes, they're, they're kind of in a controlled setting and you're keeping an eye on them as they go through this, uh, as they go through this process. The other thing to keep in mind as you're going through this is that you can reduce an intussusception with a pathologic lead point. So you can end the acute episode and still not have fixed a potentially a greater problem. Uh, and that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, what people do at that point or through this process actually is, is highly variable. This is a study looking at 27 children's hospitals, just looking at the, the, the practice standards for intussusception. You see a pr pretty uh, interesting spectrum. And what I find most interesting in this is, this, uh, is the, uh, the uh, issue of same day discharge. Uh, in our hospital, we keep patients overnight, um, but you can see that it's kind of all over the place. Um, and there certainly have been studies uh, that have been done that would suggest that you probably don't need to keep these kids in the hospital or that keeping them overnight doesn't really help you because although the, uh, a re uh, most commonly happens in the first day or two, uh, it isn't necessarily going to happen in the first eight to 12 hours. Uh, so keeping them overnight potentially is kind of, uh, you know, missing the key point where these uh, kids might uh, re, uh, represent. This is a second patient, uh, a little bit younger, but otherwise relatively similar. Again, a kid presenting with kind of a, a nonspecific uh, picture, uh, but fussy, not feeding well, fewer wet diapers. Uh, they did an ultrasound an ultrasound which suggested uh, intussusception, also had a little bit of ascites. Uh, although the exam wasn't particularly concerning, this is the abdominal entry. And these cases, incidentally, were ju just occurred within the past two weeks. Um, have a very nice ultrasound showing this, this very nice mesentery br branching off on the right side of your screen uh, from with a lumen inside of a greater lumen. And interestingly, we did a, a, an air contrast enema which showed free reflux of contrast all the way through the colon and into the terminal ileum. But yet you see these very dilated loops and the kid just wasn't quite right. So this led to a CAT scan. And this is a kind of a typical uh, textbook finding that you would expect to see on a, on a CAT scan with an intussusception where you again are seeing a mass within a lumen of bowel and you see this thin rim of contrast, of enteric contrast between the intussusceptum and the intussusceptions. So this child uh, did have uh, an intussusception, was taken to the operating room, actually had an enteroenteric intussusception with a Meckel's diverticulum as a lead point again. Um, so when do you take a kid to the operating room? Uh, well, number one, uh, non-operative failure. So if, a, if, they, if it cannot be reduced and they see evidence on that study, uh, if they want to try again, fine. Uh, but in general, a failure of non-operative means leads to operative means. Uh, what about the, the recurrent intussusception? Well, uh, we s there certainly is evidence to suggest that you can try again. So if a patient represents in a day or in a few hours or a day um, that you would try again, and we've tried up to three or four times, uh, there's really no evidence to suggest an absolute limit 
Uh, but what it, but we do know is that a child that pr at each time they represent their, their chances of having a pathologic lead point goes up. Uh, and eventually you're going to have to make that decision. I think for most surgeons, sometime around three reductions, um, you would consider taking to the operating room. What I would also suggest is that even if you've made the decision to go to the operating room, sometimes it is nice to have that patient reduced uh, non-operatively first. It'll make your operation easier and, and uh, it'll make it a little bit more obvious, a little bit more straightforward. So indications for surgery, uh, incomplete non-operative reduction, of course, signs of peritonitis, uh, very clear, uh, perforation, um, or any suggestion of an anatomic lead point. Uh, the techniques, we'll talk a little bit about an open versus uh, laparoscopic uh, approach, uh, both of which are acceptable. Um, but uh, the classic open technique would suggest that you're supposed to milk the intussusceptum out of the intussusceptiens. Uh, so to push, not pull on the bowel out of concern that you're going to uh, create an injury. Uh, but of course, as we move into laparoscopy, as is often the case, we, uh, out of necessity, we end up proving some of the old dogma wrong. Um, the goals of the operation very simply are to, re number one is to reduce it and to restore blood flow. Um, of course, you're going to uh, assess in whatever means you can for a pathologic lead point, and you're assessing for bowel viability. Uh, there is uh, there is almost certainly some ischemic uh, process ongoing, and in fact, even when you do resect, you put your two ends together, and you think you have two very healthy ends. You have to be aware that there could be some of an increased risk of anastomotic complications. Um, so, um, and then w you know when you're deciding whether to resect, of course, all these factors will 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 uh, are important in your decision. So if you have non-viable uh, bowel, if you have a pathologic lead point, if you just find that bowel to be questionable at all, the wrong thing is certainly not to resect. Um, these are just from some results from operative man management. Um, the, uh, the outcomes from reduction are good. Uh, so if you, again, if you think everything is viable, you don't find any evidence of a lead point, you can just reduce the bowel. Um, and the, there is a, a reintussusception rate, but it is low. Um, and the recurrence rate is relatively low. And certainly, if you resect, there probably is some recurrence rate, but it's extremely low, somewhere approaching 0%. This is just a picture of the manual, the classic open manual reduction. Um, the laparoscopic operation was uh, described in the mid-90s. So as I discussed, it goes against surgical dogma, it's because as you see, this is what you're doing. You're really pulling the ends apart. You can, do, in some ways, try to milk. Uh, but uh, but it, there's a lot of pulling involved, and certainly we've shown that that is okay. Um, and the successful reduction rates are kind of all over the place. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of series in the literature looking at laparoscopic reduction. This is just simply the newest and largest study. This is out of Emory, looking at a large group of patients, and this is simply shows that uh, the laparoscopic approach is successful. Certainly, the open approach. There's nothing wrong with the open approach. Um, and I think if you go into this laparoscopically, you just have to have um, a, a very low threshold for, for opening. Uh, and so it's been shown these studies that it's safe, it's effective, and it has uh, the benefits that you would expect from a laparoscopic operation as opposed to an operation with a big open uh, incision. Uh, recurrent intussusception we talked a little bit about. Um, most commonly is going to happen in the first few days, but can happen weeks, months, even years later. Um, and um, uh, certainly the as I discussed, you just have to start thinking more so about pathologic lead points and whether you need to uh, pursue an operative intervention and even a, a resection. Um, Post-operative intussusception is kind of an interesting uh, topic which isn't fully understood. This is described after um, abdominal operations and after uh, non-abdominal uh, surgery. Um, so, it, it, for, uh, in, uh, it occurs most commonly in abdominal operations with an extensive retroperitoneal component. We don't fully understand why it happens. Uh, what we do know is that more commonly this is dealt with operatively and that the non-operative uh, means uh, are not going to be employed, most likely because it's a little bit, it can pose a bit of a diagnostic dilemma in the setting of an, of an early post-operative patient. So really your workup uh, and your, your differential diagnosis has to encompass another of, uh, another other etiologies. I want to touch uh, briefly on intussusception in older children. Uh, and again, people use different ages as, as, they, when, as the benchmark where they start looking at this a little bit differently. Um, you certainly have a much greater um, uh, incidence of pathologic lead points and uh, incidence of malignancies, such as small bowel malignancies. Uh, but when you think about it, it the idiopathic uh, variety is still the most common. Um, 
So uh, you know, keep that in mind and that uh, the enema reduction is not necessarily contraindicated in older children. It still has a relatively high success rate, but you really have to uh, perform maybe, you have to be a little bit more fastidious in your search for a pathologic uh, lead point. Uh, I want to touch briefly on a case when I, when I was asked to do this talk, uh, short, I think that week I bumped into a, a friend of mine who's a general surgeon, uh, an adult general surgeon, who told me that they had just had this case. This is the case of a 36-year-old female with a very significant medical history, potentially, and the most significant part of that is a history of cystic fibrosis, had had a double lung transplant, presented to the uh, hospital with abdominal pain and a concerning uh, abdominal exam. Uh, had an x-ray which showed kind of these, this very dilated uh, loop of bowel in the pelvis and subsequently went on to a CT scan, which looked kind of like this, uh, which I think to, to many of us, this looks, uh, and, and you know, you have to look through all the cuts, but this looks really relatively uh, obvious to me as a potential intussusception where you have, uh, it's, it's a non-contrasted scan, of course, but you see, clearly has, seem to have a mass within, within aluminum of bowel. And uh, I, I thought about putting the read on the, on the CT up, but so I can wrap it up, okay. I am told I need to wrap it up, but this was, um, this was an, uh, an iliacolic intussusception. This patient uh, did have areas of uh, ischemia, underwent uh, resection, and uh, did well. Intussusception in adults is obviously not that common, uh, but it happens. Uh, very few of them are idiopathic. Most of them have some identifiable uh, uh, pathologic lead point. And uh, in particular, many of them have malignant lead points, as much as 65% of these uh, patients. So uh, really, I think the take home message in adults is uh, to uh, resect. And I'm just going to cut through to the end here. I did have a couple slides in here, which I'm glad somebody asked about it earlier about into susception after gastric bypass, and I left that to our uh, gastric bypass surgeons to discuss. So recommendations in adults uh, is probably to resect, especially in colocolonic lesions or any le lesions involving the colon. Um, and uh, again, keep in mind your heightened awareness, heightened awareness for ischemia at the edges and uh, for potential for anastomotic complications. So in summary, intussusception happens at all ages, and the presentation may vary, and the management needs to vary. Uh, early diagnosis may uh, eliminate the need for resection or at least reduce the amount of bowel, bowel that you're losing. This requires a collaborative approach with your radiologists. They can recur, and you need to evaluate for your pathologic lead point. Thank you. Thank you.